Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Is the microphone working properly? Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, at least some of you who have been coming. Uh, what I'm talking about tomorrow has to do with the English language and the way it has emerged in India uh, from being a language of colonialism, of colonial legacy, to a language of a very post-colonial ethos. And this is, some of it is a part of work that I've been doing uh, all these years on English translation. Uh, in my book called Translating India, the Cultural Politics of English, uh, which, was, which I started working on in uh, the year 2000, I was looking at how in the past two decades, basically since the 1980s, there has been a kind of upsurge of English translation in India from Indian literatures. And in the process of examining that, it seems to me that as Indian audiences and Indian readerships, we have begun to forge very new sort of ties with the English language. That a language that we considered, and it is very largely a language of elite, urban, cosmopolitanism in India, so that when you go to the big cities of India, in Bombay and Delhi and Chennai, you can take a certain degree of English for granted. Uh, at the same time, in terms, in kind of uh, relative numbers, it's a very, very small section that speaks English in India. It constitutes something between 2% to 5% of a population of 1 billion people. In absolute terms, this translates into a large number of populations. So we are talking of something like the population of New Zealand and Australia put together. So English has had this very kind of ambivalent position in India that it is a language of a very powerful, urban, elite, small minority. At the same time, it is a language that has increasingly come to be seen as pan-Indian. And straddling between these two notions, between the notion that whether it is pervasive, important, a pan-Indian language, or whether it is a language that belongs only to a certain class, and especially a bureaucratic class that brought itself up into a part of a very powerful administrative machinery during the British, uh, lie many, many histories and many notions of the English language. And it is something of this checkered relationship that English has with India is what I'm going to provide you with before I go on to actually what I have in mind, which is about the English translation of some of the literature written by the untouchable communities of India, whom we call Dalits, as in D-A-L-I-T-S, Dalits. These are the untouchable people of India who form the lowest rung, so to speak, of the caste hierarchy in India. But before I come to that, there are just a few, few kind of uh, steps backwards that I want to take you to. When someone asks me here as to what languages do I speak, I find myself, and I'm sure there are other people like me, where we say, oh, Gujarati, and Hindi, and Sindhi, and so forth. And then you say, of course, English. Yeah. Or you say, and English. Almost as if you can't say English in the same breath as you say those other languages. And I'm not quite sure why we do what we do. I'm not sure when I'm saying that. It's because I think, well, it's, t it's assumed that I know some English because I'm speaking to you in English. Or that these Indian, other Indian languages that I speak form one kind of cluster of Indianness, so to speak. And English is not quite there, but it's slightly separate. And what is this nature of separateness of English? And to what extent is it a part of us or not? Is, is a question that has always uh, interested me. Way back when I was uh, doing my master's in, in Pune University, I remember one of, the, one of the electives that I had opted for, one of the subjects that I had opted for, was Indian writing in English, and which is your Arundhati Roy and Vikram Seth and Salman Rushdie and so forth. So we, you know, not Keats and Wordsworth and Shelley and Milton, but uh, the, these, these Indian writers who were writing creatively in English. And this was a very new thing at that time. There were exactly two people in the classroom offering this paper because there was generally a view that, you know, well, Indians don't know how to write in English. They are derivative. They can only try and write like the English, but they, they can't quite do it. And uh, so there were these, a lot of these prejudices and apologies associated with the use of the English language. And this wasn't very long ago. I mean, which is not, this is no comment on my age, but all, the point I'm trying to make is that 
I remember as a, as a master's students when we used to be organizing conferences on Indian English literature, and I remember one of the first things that we would do as a topic that would necessarily be there is why I write in English. So there, there used to be a session called Why I Write in English, and you, you, we, we, would, we would be calling upon poets like <sighs> Nisim Izikal and Jain Mahapatra and you know Salim Piradina who would have to explain as to why I write in the English language. And it is out of this sense of apology and uh, that you have uh, a very well-known poet in India who writes both in Malayalam, which is a language spoken in Kerala, and also in the English language. And she has different names for herself in both languages. Like these are not the same person, that these are twin different identities. So she's called Madhavi Kutti in Malayalam, where she, uh, and she's called Kamla Das in English. And I just want to kind of share with you uh, one of her poems, which is uh, questions this stridently. And it will give you something of an idea of how people felt then. I don't know politics, but I know the names of those in power and can repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with Nehru. I'm an Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Don't write in English, they said. English is not your mother tongue. Why not leave me alone, critics, friends, visiting cousins, every one of you? Why not let me speak in any language I like? The language I speak becomes mine. Its distortions, its queerness, all mine, mine alone. It's half English, half Indian. Funny, perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I'm human, don't you see? Now, what you see here in Kamla Das's poem is not something that a writer, a Jhumpa Lahiri today, or a Salman Rushdie would be required to do, because we have passed that stage where we need to be explaining as to why we write in English. For instance, much before Kamla Das does this, way back in the 1930s, uh, you have this very well-known writer called Raja Rao, who wrote a novel called Kanthapura. And he writes in the introduction, he says, uh, uh, we cannot write like the English. We should not. And establishes how there is a certain breathless, racy speed with which we Indians look at the world and we begin to describe the world, and our English would have to be that. And therefore, his novel, Kanthapura, becomes this very interesting exercise in how he uses certain forms of the language he spoke, Kannada, and brings those speech rhythms and idiomatic expressions onto to the, to the English language. So this kind of creative experimentation, so to speak, with the English language, now making it regional, now making it something else, as Rushdi did years later, chutneyfying it, you know, these exercises continue to happen. And sometimes they, they were successful, sometimes they were not. Of course, the major kind of breakthrough that takes place is with Midnight's Children, when Rushdie is doing it very, very successfully. But even before Rushdie did, did it, you had Raja Rao doing this. Then you have this another poet called Nisim Ezekiel, who is a, a Jewish uh, poet from India. And uh, he used a certain brand of what is called Indian English. Now, of course, it may be, I'm sure that this is a subject of your, uh, your dissertation. There is, uh, you can, there can be, you know, disagreements about whether there is anything as homogenous, if you like, as Indian English, which all Indians across board would be speaking, or whether a Malayali speaker would have his, his or her own regional slant, and a Punjabi speaker would have his own slant, so that a Punjabi will not go to school, but will go to a school, so that a Malayali will go to tempered, you know. So these are, there can be regional varieties of this English language and so on. But however, there are certain kinds of features which are fairly common. You know, for instance, the use of the present continuous tense to say, oh, I was remembering you, you know, or sometimes to repeat uh, in, Engl in, in, in Indian languages, you can say that, you know, you can say, I came, how did you come here? Me chalte chalte aai. Chalta chalta avi. But in English, you can't say, I came walking, walking. Yeah, so these are, these are certain ways by which, so sometimes you found uh, poets kind of using these, and whether they were using these to kind of bring a sense of parody, 
or whether they were doing it to kind of engage in a creative experimentation, that is a different matter. It's a matter of some interpretation. But I will show you one of my favorite poems in this regard. Uh, again, a feature of 1970s. Now, this you have to absolutely hear. So I will subject you to my voice again. This is called Goodbye Party for Miss Pushpa T.S. Is anyone familiar with this? Yeah. yeah. Friends, our dear sister is departing for foreign in two, three days. And we are meeting today to wish her bon voyage. You are all knowing, friends, what sweetness is in Miss Pushpa. I don't mean only external sweetness, but internal sweetness. Miss Pushpa is smiling and smiling, even for no reason, but simply because she is feeling. Miss Pushpa is coming from very high family. Her father was renowned advocate in Balsar or Surat. I'm not remembering now which place. <laughs> Surat. Ah, yes, yes. Once only I stayed in Surat with family members of my uncle's very close friend. His wife was cooking nicely. That was long time ago. Coming back to Miss Pushpa, she's most popular lady with men also and ladies also. Whenever I asked her to do anything, she was saying, just now only I will do it. That is showing good spirit. I'm always appreciating the good spirit. Pushpa Mace is never saying no. Whatever I or anybody is asking, she's always saying yes. And today she's going to improve her prospect and we are wishing her bon voyage. Now I ask other speakers to speak and afterwards Miss Pushpa will do summing up. <laughs> now, uh, I find this interesting, not just in terms of language, you know. But there is a certain way, as you would have noticed, that it's, it's, there's a certain kind of ethos also intertwining with language here. You know, the, all these references to the wife who was cooking nicely, or to the fact that it was my uncle's old friend's uncle something whom I stayed with, or the fact that there seems to be no kind of division, if you like, between public and, you know, private sphere. There is a certain way in which in, in an Indian context you would ask questions or you would say things uh, and still get away with them. I mean, you can, you can ask questions which would be kind of construed as very, very personal questions. And this is a formal event, so to speak. Miss Pushpa is leaving, as you can see. And yet you find the speaker, who seems to me to be clearly a male speaker, but I mean, the, not that we have, there is anything else to suggest, but I, I have a feeling it is a male speaker. The way he refers to her as sister, you know, you have to kind of cover those grounds very clearly in India. That when someone is not your girlfriend or your wife or what's his name, then you clearly say sister, so that you have to bracket it off immediately. There's no in-between anywhere. So uh, you find this person going into this, and the whole ethos is tied in with the language. It's like the missing articles, the use of the present continuous tense, and so forth. Now, these are some of the way uh, some creative experimentation with the English language took place. But even in a case like this, where Nisa Musical was writing it, it wasn't taken as a serious exercise. It was seen as, here is this poet who's very urban, very metropolitan, very confident, living in Bombay, who knows his English, studied in England, and it's all very well for him to be kind of laughing like this at people who come from smaller places and Surat, Balsar, what is he talking about, okay? So this, this kind of goes on. And in a country that established itself as a post-colonial nation state in 1947 and shrugs off, at least politically, the English rule, it just seems then ironic that we don't quite know what to do with the English language. That, we, that Nehru makes his famous speech about tryst with destiny in the English language. I mean, there can't be anything more ironic than that. And then you have the nation state now seeing, all right, here is this mass of Indian languages. Now, what do we do with it? And it's, it's a very big question. It's something that I don't want to go into right now, the whole business about a common language in India and so forth. But basically, you did have very, very powerful elite section that was already kind of uh, inserted in a certain kind of bureaucracy, entrenched in power, which did not want English to go. But if you don't want it to go, where do you want it to be, so to speak? How do we slot this English language? And there is this writer called R.K. Narayan, uh, which some of you would be familiar with. And he, 
he has a very interesting story, which is not very well known, but I'm going to tell you that story now. It's called 15 Years. And uh, it's a story, there was a clause in the Constitution that since we cannot have <coughs> Hindi as the national language, because <coughs> there's a, there are certain states in India to whom Hindi was a completely alien language, and they saw it as a hegemony of the Hindi-speaking people in the north, so they didn't want that. So then what do you do? How do you have English then? And how do you actually kind of confront the fact that, look, here we are, you know, with so many Indian languages, and yet of all things we want English as our common language? It didn't quite seem okay in 47. So you had uh, the government coming up with this, what it thought was some kind of a temporary solution. It said, all right, let's do one thing. Let's have English language now till these southern states learn some Hindi, <laughs> till they begin to kind of manage to get rid of their reservation about the Hindi. And in 15 years, we will try and uh, kind of gradually take English away, and it will be substituted with Hindi. Now, this just seemed like a plausible solution to them then. So you have this writer, R.K. Naran, who writes the story, and you have in the story <coughs> a court scene. And you've got this judge that is sitting, and English language has been brought to trial. And she stands there in the witness box. She, it's a she, yeah? Queen Britannia and what have you. So she stands in the witness box, and the judge is kind of saying that, look, there are these many charges against you. And uh, you know you brought Shakespeare and all that to this country, and you divided people into those who knew Shakespeare and those who didn't know Shakespeare, and you made these class wedges in our country, and you have created such huge divisions, and, and there are poor students who study in schools, and they, and, and they fail because they don't know the English language. Now we have to absolutely come to some kind of a judgment about you. And so you've got this English language standing there with you know great sense of kind of apology and contriteness or whatever, and she stand and she says, she says, look, I'll I'll wear a sari, I'll wear a bindi, I'll put a sindoor in my head. I will try to be as Indian as possible, but just let me stay. You know, I'll I'll be exactly like you. You won't be able to tell me from the rest. And uh, he says, uh, okay, all right. We pause. He says the. We postponed this, you know, we are giving you 15 years time to do this. And she says, 15 years from when and up to what time? Now the judge is very confused because he doesn't really know what to do. So he said, <coughs> no, never mind, the court is adjourned. <laughs> and so we are at that stage even now. You know, this was in 1965 that we were supposed to have switched back from English to Hindi, but it hasn't quite happened, not in a way that it was envisaged. If at all Hindi has spread and there are more people speaking in Hindi, the, the credit goes to an Amitabh Bachchan or a Shah Rukh Khan or, or, or Aishwarya Rai or whatever the Bollywood films we see. It has nothing to do with the government fiat. So now some of these tensions, if you like, some of these reflections upon the English language is some, something that I have begun to see in the literary history of, of India. And since my own engagement has been largely with translation, it is in the area of translation that I see a lot of this happening. And it, has, it, it seems to me that there is now, at least post-90s, a certain kind of comfort, if you like, that we experience with the English language. And we don't see it as a language that's, uh, that's the other. We don't see it as a language that's, that has anything to do with colonialism. If at all, it's a language of IT, it's a language of globalization. But we, the memory of English as a colonial legacy is increasingly kind of wearing off. And not just that, it is a language that we think is in happy relationship, if you like, with the Indian languages we speak. So a lot of bilingualism that you see in Spoken, spoken rhythms in captions, on hoardings, in film titles, such as this one, has to do, I think, with this new relationship that we have entered with in the English language. I mean, look at this. This is called Pyar Me Twist. <laughs> or you've got another film. I don't have the clip here, but there's a new one which came out, I think, just before I was leaving, <clears throat> called Pyar Ke Side Effects. <laughs> or you've got the Domino's uh, ad in India. It's called Hungry Kya. You know, so there are ways by which it sits now comfortably kind of next to our Indian languages. And it is in this relationship that I explore some of my own research on English translation 
And my thesis is something like this, that there are those who write in the Indian languages and in those multitude of languages. And a lot of that writing people have begun to feel in India and overseas and so on is what is rich and vibrant and diversified kind of writing taking place in Marathi and Gujarati and Kannada and so forth. But how does that writing actually become accessible not only to people outside India, but even to people within India who do not speak those languages. So if I want to read about literature that's produced in Manju state, for instance, how do I do it? The only means I have of doing it is by using the English language, by reading it in English translation. Similarly, his child or the grandchild may also not read in Kannada and would therefore need the English language. So then spatially, temporally, in every way, it would seem that this is one language of access, not only to power and liberalization or globalization, but it is also a language of access sometimes to your own roots, which is a very ironic kind of a role that English is playing for something which was seen as so uh, disembodied and made you seem so uprooted or not rooted in your own Indian context. Sometimes you need this language now to access your own roots, so to speak. Uh, and while I was exploring this relationship, I have now come to a stage where I see that not only, that many of the objections that people had about the English language, those who were very nationalist and felt that, you know, like Gandhi, that, this, this, that we don't need it or we need to restrict its use and so forth, even they have begun to kind of see if English writing is still something of a problem, they do not see English translation as a problem at all. Because the idea is that the original writing, so to speak, in these various Indian languages, that continues to take place. And that is quote unquote authentic. Now that authentic writing stands where it is, but it has now been made available into an English language. So there is a local linguistic community for which that writing exists. And there is also a larger community for which English is uh, making this available. So English translation has been, is being seen now as this golden mean, if you like, between the local and global. And it seems to inhere none of the problems that English by itself seems to have. As I go on with this work further, uh, and I tried to actually situate this in the whole uh, business about changing publishing industry in India and changing educational policies and readership patterns. Some of my work now after that, after that book has been to see how, what this language does, especially its translation to some of the marginalized communities in India. And it is there where I want to take you. I mean, these were just kind of general remarks about the English language. But I'm now going to take you to the literature produced by Dalits, by untouchable communities in India. And I see that as I see English performing a very, very interesting role there, one that we had never envisaged. In the last about one decade, or perhaps even less, there, has been, there have been a series of autobiographies, some fiction, some poetry, but largely autobiographies, by writers who come from castes that have not had social acceptance in India. And there are many such castes. I'm not going into that right now, but you feel free to ask that later in the question answer session. So you have literature being produced by people who are considered untouchable, writing about the pain and the misery that they go through. And that kind of writing is also coming into the English language and giving you an insight into an other India, an India that is not always shining, an India that is not always liberal, that's not always global, an India where a lot of awful things happen. And it is, it is, it is that section that I am now going into. If you have any questions about what I've so, said so far, I'm happy to field them right now before I go. OK, then we just uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm now going to take you to this part of my presentation. I call this translating subalternate or translating caste, yet another role for English in India.
Okay. <clears throat> Those uh, statements that you saw are from English translations of some of the autobiographies by Dalit writers. And these writers come from very different languages and different religions, but they've all been published in very recent times. My mother is an untouchable, while my father is a high caste from one of the privileged classes of India. Mother lives in a hut, father in a mansion. Father is a landlord, mother landless. I am an akkaramashi. I'm condemned, branded, illegitimate. This is from an autobiography by a writer called Sharan Kumar Limbale, which came out two years ago. How is it that people consider us too gross even to sit next to when traveling. They look at us with the same look they would cast on someone suffering from a repulsive disease. This is from a writer called, a woman writer called Bama, who lives in Tamil Nadu, one of the southern states in India, and she writes in Tamil. The previous writer I mentioned to you writes in Marathi, which is a different language. I have asked many scholars to tell me why Savarnas or upper caste Hindus hate Dalits and Shudras so much. The Hindus who worship trees and plants, beasts and birds, why are they so intolerant of Dalits? And this is from a writer who writes in Hindi. The name is Valmiki. Sharan Kumar Limbale, Bama and Om Prakash Valmiki belong to different parts of the country. Limbale lives in Maharashtra and writes in Marathi. Bama is a teacher in Tamil Nadu and writes in Tamil. Om Prakash Valmiki lives in Northern India and writes in Hindi. Born as an illegitimate child to an untouchable mother, Limbale rose to become the regional director of a university. From an untouchable community in Tamil Nadu, Bama moved to a Christian convent, which she hoped would give her and many others like her a life of dignity and equality. On finding Christianity in India equally caste-ridden, she quit the convent and now teaches in a school. Valmiki asserts his distance and exclusion from Hinduism by adopting his scavenger and untouchable caste as his last name, Valmiki. He is an ordinance officer in the town of Dehradun. Thus, all three authors that I showed you so far, all three represent not only different languages and regions, but also different religious identities. What binds them is their exclusion from mainstream and upper caste India. They represent the Indian subaltern experience that has occasionally been expressed on behalf of them, but now they tell their own stories. The excerpts that I've showed you so far are from their life stories where they share a history of pain and humiliation, anger and condemnation for a caste system that continued to place them outside the pale of humanity, although untouchability was legally abolished in India in 1949. The three authors are but three voices from amongst a multitude of such voices in India, products of a pernicious and unbreakable caste system that puts some individuals on a pedestal while some others are placed at the bottom of the pyramid, the authors document their moments of dispossession as well as relative liberation. Their ability to document their anger and pain sets them apart from million others like them. Caste is not an unchanging and static reality that characterizes the social structure of Indian society. It is part of a living consciousness. It's, not, it's beyond my scope right now to communicate to you the heterogeneity and complexity of caste practices. At one level, the manifestation of caste discrimination is not any different from racial discrimination. However, some read misreadings and readings of ancient texts may also lead one to assume that caste is sanctioned by religion. It may be said briefly that what were formerly called the untouchables, and now the Dalits, embrace one-sixth of India's population. The Dalits also have internal hierarchies and differences depending upon class, gender, and relative position in the caste system. For instance, there is much dividing an upwardly mobile, urban, educated, employed, employed Dalit from his rural counterpart who has not yet had access to forms of modernity. Through processes of affirmative action, a minuscule of Dalits have been empowered. However, a large majority live through different shades of discrimination because caste is not merely a scriptural clause, but a lived experience. 
In spite of their heterogeneity, Dalit writers such as Limbale, Bama, and Valmiki, and others are brought together today, for I'm concerned with their commonality as Dalit writers who have come into the English language. Now, I just need to kind of clarify just a couple of things here. Uh, he, the most well-known leader for uh, Dalits, for these untouchables, who tried to organize them as a political constituency, was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, and who gave to the untouchables of India a huge sense of self-assertion -assert and dignity by calling them Dalits, as in D-A-L-I-T-S, Dalits. And etymologically, the word Dalit means crushed. You know, you crush dal, lentils. That process of crushing, a deliberate oppression, so to speak, not a natural state of being, is what he used to remind them that we have been socially, systemically crushed. And it is not just something the way we were born. Before Ambedkar conferred the word, the term Dalits on them, you had Gandhi calling them Harijans which is children of God. And there has been this huge uh, debate about between Gandhi and Ambedkar about the term and their respective ideologies and so on, which is a slightly complicated issue I don't want to go into. But basically, Gandhi's notion of calling them children of God was governed by what came to be seen as some kind of a paternalistic kindness that, you know, these are also people, we should be good to them, you know and making an appeal to the upper caste, so to speak, that you know, you should have pity on them, or that you should be good to them, that we are making an appeal to your kindness, so to speak, whereas Dalit is like clearly very, very political. So now nobody uses the word Harijan. In fact, it is seen as a derogatory term, but people use the word Dalits. So that's what I would be using now. And then you, I uh, take you to how the English language was a part of the kind of social transformation that was taking place even in Ambedkar's own lifetime. I mean, B.R. Ambedkar studied in Columbia University, and then he writes his PhD on caste in the English language. He begins to access Sanskrit texts, which he, Sanskrit which he did not know, which has been seen as, which is a language of the Brahmins and the elites and so on, and Dalits were not even taught it. And he uses those texts in English to show that how sometimes religion in India has sanctioned caste practices. So English was a part of that kind of emancipatory, transformatory agenda also. So I'm just going to kind of uh, cite Ambedkar to you. Uh, when Ambedkar's centenary year took place, many of his writings went through translation to other Indian languages, and that also played a very huge role. Uh, so Ambedkar writes this very well-known essay called Who Were the Shudras, as in who were these untouchables? And someone told him, well, he did not know the ancient scriptures. What was he writing about? And in response, Ambedkar admits the role of English as a medium by which he accessed Sanskrit texts. And he declared, and I'm quoting him, the want of knowledge of Sanskrit need not be a bar to my handling such a theme as the present. I know the English language. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of very interesting. Uh, besides using English as a means of accessing Sanskrit texts and exposing their ideological support to social inequalities, Ambedkar also used English to express his own ideas of social and political democracy. He also used narratives from his own life to show, in a simple and accessible manner, the everydayness of the caste system. Thus, through theory and practice, Ambedkar supported the articulation of Dalit struggle and its expression or translation into English. Now, loosely speaking, what, what we call Dalit literature in India is really what you would call protest literature. But it's more common to talk about Gujarati Dalit literature and Marathi Dalit literature instead of using a generic term because there are variations. A large amount of Dalit literature in India comes from Maharashtra, which is where Bombay is, and because that is where Ambedkar made that place his political sphere. So you do, so therefore even in English translation you see a lot of that slant taking place. Uh, but you have these over the years with some democratization of education and some access to the alphabet, so to speak, or to literacy, you do have now some writers who would have never imagined their ancestors to write or to go to school or to have literacy. Now you do have some members of those families coming into a city 
writing their autobiography, writing about the experiences that they have gone through. And it is from some of that writing that you, it comes into the English language. Uh, to give you kind of something of an idea of the phenomenon I'm talking about, of the number of works which have been translated into the English language in these last 10 years or so, uh, I want you to see this. It's quite phenomenal. This is only barely a decade. except this one, this came slightly earlier. It's not possible to talk about Dalit literature without the accompanying political activism that characterizes such a phenomenon. In most states, Dalit literature gathered steam when the upper caste went on a rampage to protest against affirmative action for the Dalits. Dalit writers are mostly involved in grassroots movements for emancipating their own brethren, and their voices tend to take on the burden of representation. The candid nature of the autobiographies that have come into English clearly shows that the writing of such autobiographies must have been an act of courage for the Dalit writers. For instance, the author, that, uh, one of the texts that you saw, which was called Against All Odds, there was this man, a blue text. The author, Kishore Shantabai Kale, created a storm in the literary circles of Maharashtra by describing candidly his experiences as the son of a tamasha dancer. For the first time, the sexual exploitation in the life of a dancer was exposed to a wider public, first through Marathi and eventually through English. Kale brought to readers who considered tamasha only an innocent form of vernacular dance in Maharashtra, a lifestyle that they were hardly aware of. After the publication of the autobiography, he also set up counseling centers for tamasha dancers to raise awareness about AIDS and sexual exploitation. The autobiography proudly uses the mother's name, Shantabai is his mother's name, as the middle name and makes a political statement about the community to which the mother belonged. Thus, the journey from personal liberation to Dalit liberation is not very long, and very often autobiography becomes the site where we see both intertwine. Translations extend this to a wider world in both disruptive and enriching ways. To continue with this point about enmeshing articulation and activism, I'll cite you another example from a writer called Lakshman Gaikwad. There are these two writers, very well known in Marathi, Lakshman Gaikwad and Lakshman Mane. And they belonged to a particular, uh, it's a bit odd, but they belonged to what in India are called uh, denotified tribes. These were tribes that the British didn't know where they belonged. You know, They didn't seem to f fit into any of the caste system structure, because these were people usually living in, in the woods and creating a lot of trouble for the British. So they conveniently call these criminal tribes. And then in mid-1950s, they were given a slightly more respectable name, and now they are called denotified <laughs> tribes, as in tribes that are not criminal, but then they still can't fit into any category, so to speak. And you've got some of the, and there are a lot of stereotypes about them, some of which are true, which is that they pickpocket, but then there are the levels of poverty are really, really abysmal. So you find some of these writers now talking about you know, how they pickpocket and how they do stealing and how they do thieving, and it's very interesting and it's quite sad. So one such writer uh, who mentions in his, 
there was one, one thing I showed you, it was called Uchalya, which means, as, as in U-C-H-A-L-Y-A, which means petty thief. The autobiography is called Petty Thief. And then he, he begins by saying, no native place, no birth date, no house or farm, no caste either. This is how I was born, in an Uchalya community. And then there is another autobiography where the writer says that the very fact that I've written this autobiography he, he is, 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 was a very risky thing to have done. And he says from, the panch, from our panchayat's point of view, the fact that he revealed all this about his community as to how they steal and what they do and how they form gangs and so forth, he says from our community council's point of view, he says the very writing of this book is a crime. And he says, I'm aware of the provision of punishment for such wrongdoing. I'm prepared to face the consequences. And then he says, is it because my father has already conducted the weddings of both my sisters that I have dared to write as I have? So th both these writers also continue to be very activists. They work for the denotified tribes. So the writing of the Dalit autobiography and the engagement in the political movement also shed a new light on their personal lives and give them <coughs> a larger picture. For instance, he, Limbale mentions that it was only through Dalit movement and literature I understood that my mother was not an adulteress, but the victim of a social system. Although Limbale's autobiography had reached many Indian languages without the mediation of English, he believes that the English translation would bring the grievances of Dalits into public, possibly world focus. It is not to say that the woes of India's untouchables have never entered its literary and public discourse. However, Dalits have always been spoken for and have not become a part of human rights concerns outside India. Uh, when the UN conference in Durban took place some four years ago, this was one of the raging issues, whether the Dalits wanted to take the whole business about caste discrimination to the UN, and they wanted it to be brought on table. And there was a lot of controversy in India, among, especially among sociologists, whether caste is a racial phenomenon or is it a social phenomenon and you know whether it's a biological issue or you know whether we need to do this and should we be what you know kind of washing our dirty linen in public so to speak this is india's problem we'll settle it all it's we'll settle it it's all within family now why do we want to take it to the un and show the world what is happening here but that's precisely what the some of the dalit activists wanted to do so you have arundhati roy who says I do believe that in India, we've practiced a form of apartheid that goes unnoticed by the rest of the world. And it is as important for Dalits to tell their stories as it has been for colonized peoples to write their own histories. English translation validates, supports, and extends the Dalit movement temporally and spatially. It confirms what the editors of a study on Dalit narratives say about Dalit articulation, and I quote, a call for change and an assertion of self-respect appear to be emerging from among them. And it seems to us important to trace this slightly significant, if still slight, trend to show that the subaltern can and does speak. The translation of subaltern literature supports the struggle of subalternity, especially when done with empathy and understanding. In the, in the, in the section that I will uh, discuss with you right now, I'm showing you how the English language is made to not just bend and change and modify, but then the caste experience, which is not even a part of a memory of the English language, comes into the English language through translation. For instance, the first autobiography that I talked to you about, Akarmashi. <clears throat> the translator, Satish Bhumkar, brings to the casteless English language the register of caste. By retaining the title Akarmashi, Along with its English equivalent, the English-speaking readers are made to reckon with a category, an identity called half-caste. Similarly, Lakshmi Holmstrom, who is the translator of this Tamil writer Bama I mentioned to you, the, the, the autobiography is called Karuku, which means leaf. And it's a leaf that has a double edge. It's like sh sharp from both ends. And it is only when you read the autobiography you realize that how it's a metaphor of her own existence where she stands rejected by Hinduism and she converts to Christianity and even in Christianity she considers she, she continues to be a Dalit. Then there is my own translation of uh, this very well-known Gujarati Dalit novel called Angaliyat. And it's called Angaliyat in Gujarati. It me, Angali uh, means finger. 
and Angaliath is one who is a child who is led by his finger to the house of his new step parent. If the mother or the father has remarried, so the child goes to another house and it's like being a stepchild. And the writer uses this to describe an entire untouchable community which is like a stepchild. So it becomes a larger metaphor. And in my English translation retains that, that title, and it also has the English equivalent to suggest that there is something larger here, so to speak. And these, I think, this, when this happens to the English language, I think there is, there is a kind of a new reality, a new caste reality that English is being forced to kind of reckon with. And there are several such examples from these autobiographies, but I will, I will spare you that. Uh, and I'll kind of go on to the politics of representation. And which is to say which Dalit writers do come into the English language and which don't. And there is a, there's a whole complex business about how even among untouchables, there are many gradations. You know, People usually don't know, but even among the untouchables, there are Dalit Brahmins. Then there are those who are, and you no, know, they call themselves Brahmins. They actually do, they officiate some of the rituals for other Dalits. And then there are those who are still lower, and then there are those who are still lowest. Some of the uh, principles, some of the affirmative action measures don't even go down almost to that bottom, so that you've only got some kind of a creamy layer that continues to have the advantage of many of the affirmative action policies in India. Uh, so what you see in writing is only a product of that small section. And then another politics about this whole business is that the English translation is carried out by people like me. I mean, right? about people who are privileged and upper caste. It's published by publishing houses, which are again run by upper castes. Most of the time, it is being read by people who are upper castes. So the entire machinery, if you like, of knowledge is still in the hands of people like us. And so we, we translate this, we read this, as to what is our own political relationship with this whole business is, 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 a, is another phenomenon altogether. But as far as the Dalit writers are concerned, at the moment they feel that at least their voices are being heard. Some of them, by being, after being translated into English, have also been translated into French. For some weird reason, there is a lot of interest in Paris these days in Dalit literature, and I really have no idea why. But there was a literary festival which invited a lot of these Dalit writers, and whom people could read because it was now in English, published by presses like Oxford University Press and you know Orient Longman and. So it's available in an, in an international garb, in, with an international press. It does a lot of good to them as of now. Uh, one hopes that there will be a time when there is a bigger representation and they can do their own writing and translating and publishing and so forth. So you've got this writer, Bama, who says that it is because of English translation I get world platform to present myself and my community. And it has become, she says, my, my work has become a part of an academic community. It got many prizes and awards. So there's been a lot of kind of a very good reception of this. Uh, as far as, and there's also this, that there's not only prestige in terms of awards and large sales, but there are, there's this wider dissemination attached with English translation, but there's one more thing. And this is very, very, lo this is like local politics. Now let me just give you a hypothetical, a kind of an example from the language that I work with. I live in the state of Gujarat, okay, which is like this, state that's north of Bombay. I'm assuming everyone knows where Bombay is, because if, the, <laughs> never mind. So <laughs> now, the official language of that state is Gujarati. People who run the literary machinery, so to speak, the literary establishment, they're all male, they're all upper caste, and they're all minimum age 65. And they will not entertain writers who are what they think are young, which of course is a huge compliment because they think everyone is young. And then they also will not entertain writers from the untouchable community because these writers write with extremely raw imagery and they write, they use dialects and they, so they upturn or overturn if you like some of the aesthetic norms that the upper caste uses. So then the Gujarati literary establishment will go on about, it has invented this, this interesting kind of uh, dichotomy or this difference between what it says is Dalit literature, which is the literature I've been talking to you about, 
and then what it calls Lalit literature. Lalit means beautiful. So it says this is Dalit, which means it's, you know, it's like dialect and it's rough and it's raw. And then there is Lalit, which is beautiful literature. So almost as if one can't be the other. And very often these writers, if they want to be published or translated, if you like, or recommended for a certain kind of a prize, then there is this local politics by which they are not able to do it. So an English translation very often makes, helps them bypass that entire local politics. And that's kind of another advantage they have. It may be useful now at this stage to acknowledge other forces that consolidate Dalit writing and its translation into English. The inclusion of Dalit studies, courses on identity politics, race and ethnicity in some universe, universities in India and abroad has provided impetus for publishers to invest time and money in undertaking such publications. The editor and publisher Mandira Sen, who runs a publishing house dedicated entirely to Dalit writing in Calcutta, she says, the US and UK rights for Juton were bought by Columbia University Press. If the Americans have Anita Desai and Arundhati Roy on their reading lists, why not a Dalit text? Thus, both capitalistic considerations and commitment appear to govern the spurt of Dalit literature in English translation. Meanwhile, as the theoretician Gail Omwet suggests, Dalits are taking advantage of globalization. They have shown an ability to interlink, use the internet, make alliance with other oppressed groups like African Americans and organize themselves. And since they are more humane, more interesting and dramatic, and have a more truthful cause than their Brahminical and upper caste opponents, they are winning a race as well. Uh, an ironic postscript to what I've been telling you is that there are, you find students in Indian universities doing their MPhils and their PhDs and master's dissertations on Dalit writers, and you know, it's, uh, it's considered to be like slightly cutting edge, if you like, to be doing that. And yet, you may find students who would do that but not sit next to a Dalit or not eat or not eat with him or her. I mean, it's not something everyone will tell you, but that's the way it is. While the picture that I have given you so far appears liberal and advantageous to Dalits, it's important to remember that translation practices take place in the realm of power. The translators and publishers, as also a large number of readers of Dalit texts in English are non-Dalits, and fundamentally, they are in the business of writing about, translating, or publishing, and editing Dalit texts. Their selection of texts lean heavily towards literature of pain and suffering. Uh, according to Ravi Kumar, who runs this pub small publishing house, and he's a Dalit himself, he says these people rarely engage with the work of Dr. Ambedkar. The problem is, unlike blacks and feminists, autonomous Dalit publishing has not emerged in India. Some degree of slant is inherent in the very act of translation. The Dalits who do the speaking have had the luxury to speak because they are, to that extent, already a part of a middle-class bourgeoisie that has broken free of traditional caste constraints. The many castes that form the lower rungs of caste hierarchy have yet to do that, and their voices are as yet unheard and therefore untranslated. Until such a time comes when Dalits are literate and politically conscious, and when the machinery of knowledge is not only hands of non-Dalits, a fully democratic representation is an unrealized dream. And then I simply want to kind of uh, now wind up by saying how English, which is the language in question of today's presentation, belonged to the white master in the past and is now wielded powerfully by India's urban elite. It would seem on this count an entirely unsuitable language and an alien vehicle to carry the experiences of pain of the untouchables or the scheduled caste of India. And yet, theoretically and potentially speaking, English translation can embrace the metropolitan as well as the rural, recognized and unrecognized languages, written and oral, upper caste, and Dalit experiences, and yet meet the needs of a wide market. No other, and I'm saying this in quotes, pan-Indian language is this acceptable to different sections whose cause English is expected to represent. Unlike Sanskrit, which carries the memory of caste domination, English can also represent a Dalit standpoint, a Bhaujan standpoint, and help us imagine Indian unity. The movement from Manuvad. Manuvad is a term that I derived from a very ancient text, which is one of the most villainous pieces in our history, 
because it, it is what mentioned that the Brahmins should be doing this and the Dalits should be doing that and so forth. It's called the laws of Manu. So when you say Manuvad, it means casteism, you know. So when you say this person is casteist, you say he's a Manuvadi. So the movement from Manuvad to Anuvad. Now I'm doing something very clever here, so you please pay attention. <laughs> so Manuvad to Anuvad, and Anuvad is translation. So the movement from Manuvad to Anuvad stands fully justified and validated by those who never got to speak. Thank you.